And I guess with Norman here, we're about ready to begin. Yes, indeed. So hi, everyone. Lots to discuss. For our top news, there's a cheap and efficient way to directly convert industrial carbon dioxide into oxygen and solid carbon. Hmm. In technology, a robot artist, and this is the robot artist's name, Ida, has been released. He'd been captured by Egyptian border guards. And Richard asked the question, what rights does an AI have? An environment, and I won't say much more now, but apparently what the whole thing is, the climate is a disaster is already here. For materials, there are light emitting diodes and they're low cost and they're based on nanoparticles and Richard will tell us about that. Apparently, as with all of the material stuff, it's very, very important. <laughs> on flight and space and astronomy, why might extraterrestrial intelligence be more likely to be artificial rather than biological? And now talking about biology, synthetic biology, it's a call to metal better. How should we use this? I'm not really sure what that means. For us, an enriched environment can fire up our synapses, even in our ability to regenerate, like after a stroke. And in health, surgeons have successfully tested pig kidney transplant in human patients. Gosh, if I were a pig, I might be worried. So that's what we'll discuss today. And Richard, what's this in the top story that was a cheap and efficient way to directly convert industrial carbon dioxide into oxygen and solid carbon. Now, one of the issues that we have to face now is what are we going to do with the carbon that's already in our atmosphere? Even if we stopped polluting magically today, there are still millions of tons of carbon in our atmosphere that uh, will affect our climate as long as it's there. So one of the things we have to do is take carbon out of the atmosphere. And right now, the biggest plans that exist about carbon capture and sequestration are the ones where they would pump CO2 for miles in pipelines and then put it underground in uh, empty oil wells. Uh, of course, paying off the guys who have the oil wells. So the energy companies love this plan. It gives them more money. But it, uh, to me, sounds like a harebrained idea and one that has lots of costs and lots of problems. And so anyway, now, after years of experimentation with different uh, catalysts, an Australian team of researchers has devised a cheap and scalable ways with the help of a little mechanical energy to split CO2 into carbon and oxygen. And now the problem with uh, all of this CO2 conversion is that uh, CO2 is difficult to get to because it's a very stable chemical compound. And so what you have to do if you're going to be reacted is put some energy into it that helps to activate the reaction. And ways they have that they've been doing this so far, you can do it with heat or electricity or light energy. Right now, every way they have to do it uses a lot of energy and requires high temperatures, uh, 
above a thousand F and it's a slow reaction. So it's the only problem is that it's expensive and slow. But so uh, our Australian scientists though have come up with a completely different approach where they're using mechanical energy to convert motion into electrochemistry. The uh, technical name for what they're doing is it's based on the triboelectric effect. And there's a complicated explanation as to what that is, but really it's static electricity. You know how if you rub uh, a balloon to your head, it'll stick to your head. It's the same basic idea. And uh, using this, they were able to achieve a 92% efficiency for conversion of CO2 into solid carbon. And uh, they were did it basically at 100F, not 100C, but 100F. So it's not high temperature. It'll be the normal temperature for the Earth in a couple of years. Anyway, and uh, it doesn't require a lot of energy at uh, last year's energy cost, it would uh, cost about $28 per ton of carbon to pull it out of the atmosphere. I've certainly heard uh, carbon costs talked about in the $100 a ton region. And if people polluters are paying that and then you can take the carbon out at $28 a ton then carbon removal could be a very profitable industry that would sure be good to get carbon out of the air and uh, this process uh, they've run it for a uh, hundred hours and seen no deterioration and uh, it uses catalysts that are not consumed in the reaction. So it's something that you can just keep going with and it doesn't deteriorate. The key to it is liquid gallium, which I had never heard of before this article. And it shows how poorly I know my chemistry. Gallium is an element, a metal, that like mercury is liquid at room temperature. It's not toxic like mercury though. And they, uh, to get this, they got droplets of liquid gallium suspended in a solution and then uh, added some silver fluoride salt and this created a crystal, silver, silver gallium crystals. And uh, when it did it in a way to make these crystals rod shaped, then it is effective and it will do this reaction where it gets its mechanical energy from to power this reaction is they put sound waves into the liquid and the sound waves, you know, makes these little atoms bounce around. And when these two kind of atoms bounce into each other, then they cause the CO2 to change its uh, ionization stage. And so the CO2 loses an electron and instead of being chemically stable, then it's ready to react and ready to go. And uh, since the only other thing it has around it is additional carbon atoms, it will make a sheet of uh, graphite oxide, graphene oxide, and of course the sheet and oxygen and the uh, sheet of the graphite 
is uh, also itself useful, and they think they'll be useful for making high-tech batteries and also these high-tech, very strong carbon uh, nanofibers. And so you make from the process something uh, oxygen, which is uh, useful and valuable, and uh, graphene, which is useful and valuable. And uh, then it's adopted right now. The intent is to use it with flu gases. And uh, they have a test bed that is going well. They also have this is so promising that already there's a startup company that has been formed to uh, make this process and start to use it for industrial flu gas uh, conversion. So this is a fairly simple, fairly inexpensive way to uh, reduce the uh, carbon that is in the gas and uh, it is the most promising thing that I've heard about carbon re removal so far. Any thoughts? Yes, it's interesting because uh, that it was an Australian team that came up with it because Australia is the world's 12 largest polluter just ahead of the United States. And the other thing is Australia for some years ago had a short lived experiment with the carbon tax, uh, but it was repealed with a, when a new political party came to power. Um, so uh, it would be interesting, half of Europe, uh, roughly half of Europe have a carbon tax, Sweden the largest, uh, but the United States doesn't have it yet. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Would you mind going and getting Greta from outside? I think she's confused. She's along the head. Okay. Excuse me, Jack. Okay. Uh, one thing, one uh, item I think, uh, Richard, when they were talking about the $28 a ton, it was to get it out of uh, simulated flue gas rather than out of the air. To get it right. out of the air. It was not out of the air. This is an industrial solution, not a reduced uh, carbon in the air solution. You're exactly right. And usually um, it, these things, it almost sounds too good to be true, but so did transistors when they first came out. So maybe uh, this is a good answer. But the problem with catalysts is they're often poisoned by other uh, chemicals in the uh, feed stream. And mm -hmm. so there would be lots of technical issues to sort out here before this would be a commercial process, but it's sure. a good start. And it's, uh, to me, this is also one of only several uh, electrocatalyst stories that I've heard dealing with ways to uh, pull the CO2 out of the air. And some of them look like they are promising for this direct air removal, like you were speaking of, not just for the industrial flue gases. And this direct air removal is what we need because that's where uh, so many gigatons of carbon are. It sounds good to me in that um, <laughs> it's almost like a catalytic converter on a car's uh -huh. exhaust system. So every chimney stack could have one of these in. And yes. You would just get oxygen coming out the top, and that would be. Uh, oh, oxygen is a polluter. Hey, that would be okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, we can move on. Um, and around AI, what's this about Egyptian border guards releasing a robot artist? And well, I think this is interesting for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but here, let me just show you something before we go. The first, I want to show you uh, on this uh, article we had about periscovite crystals 
this is a term you hear a lot about nowadays in materials. And here is a, a diagram of these periscovite crystals. And the periscovites are this little uh, kind of uh, cube turned on its side is the individual crystal and then when it is grouped together with a bunch of them then it's in the crystalline form that is used for different things and i thought that since we have talked about periscovite so much that i should show you a picture and this is it will continue to find out more about them because these are uh interesting uh, structures that have a lot of uh, good properties for electronics. Anyway, we're talking about the artist being released by uh, the Egyptian border guard. This is, I'm not sure how to sound, say her name. I say it Aida. And here is the artist. Uh, standing in front of one of her famous self-portraits. And uh, she, for the Egypt, uh, the reason she was in Egypt to begin with is she was scheduled uh, to show her work at a great pyramid of Giza ceremonies that was this week. I think they were also going to do it with a piece of celebratory music from the opera named Aida. So no wonder they wanted to have this artist there. But anyway, uh, when they were taking the artist through customs, in crates, not walking, the, both the artist and her artwork were in crates, the Egyptian customs official stopped this artist right at the border, and they were suspicious of her modem and also of her camera. And uh, they thought maybe she was a security risk and they weren't going to let her into the country. And uh, it took more than a week to get this settled. But finally, it did get settled and she was able to get to her big show. Now, there's a statement from uh, the embassy about this uh, and the embassy is glad to see the artist robot has been cleared through customs and quote custom clearance procedures can be lengthy and are required before any importation of artworks or IT equipment. And I guess uh, AIDA was both so they had a double problem. But anyway, she got there and she was able to uh, do her sculpture exhibit. I wanted to find a picture of the sculpture, but I couldn't. The sculpture was her interpretation of uh, the Greek riddle of the Sphinx. How appropriate for a Sphinx show, you know, and the Greek riddle was what goes on four feet in the morning, two at noon, and three feet in the evening? And her interpretation of that famous Greek riddle is a sculpture of herself with three legs. And I'm not sure if I get it, but I guess you had to be in on the joke. But... Uh, it certainly raises questions uh, that are relevant with AI, including what are the limits between AI and people. What that means for customs is what kind of laws apply, because the laws are different 
for humans. Humans have some kind of right, supposedly, and the only right that property has is property rights and intellectual property rights. And so there certainly are questions there. And we know that the issue of what is a human is one that is being contested now. There's some other AI that has gotten citizenship in Saudi Arabia. And then I just read recently there are some uh, cocaine hippos from Escobar or something like that that have been granted personhood by some U.S. court. I'm not sure what that's about. And I don't know if the hippos have personhood, if that means that they can vote. And if they do, who would they vote for and what kind of ballots would you use? But, you know, this issue of what does it mean to be a person is getting more fuzzy all the time. Any thoughts? Well, for one, I, uh, I heard Fred uh, I mean, uh, Richard referred to, to this thing as G, the artist. And I think it's more appropriate when you're talking, to, talking about robots that we use it rather than he or she <laughs> to begin with. And, uh, and then uh, as far as rights are concerned, I think the uh, rights are uh, the person who is in control of, of the robot. And... Uh, and then, so it, it, you could look at it as an extension of, of the person who is, mm -hmm. who is uh, you know, in, in charge of this thing. That, that's, I think, where the rights, you know, should, should, should go. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, my wife, Carol, would agree with you that if there's any art involved, then the artist was the creator of the robot, not the robot. All right. It's ironic that uh, this should happen in Egypt because Egypt doesn't have such a good record on human rights. <laughs> well, fortunately, it wasn't a human. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't have done any good if it, if, if it was, you know. <laughs> now, another aspect of this that is interesting to me is... Uh, Carol and I have had an this ongoing discussion literally for decades now about what is art. And one of the reasons we continue to have the discussion is it's still enough up in the air that we can still talk about it 30 years later. And we still don't know. But anyway, so one of the theories that has come up in this discussion is whether art is a product, the thing that you make when you're arting, or if art is more internal and experience. And I would say that AIDA shows or argues that art is the product since nobody here, I think, would say that the AI had an experience of painting. But I would go further and say that it's, it's not necessarily the experience of the artist creating the art, but it's the experience of the person viewing sure. or experiencing the art. Right. And that's, it could be art. Yes. Anyway, that has been also the basis for part of our discussion, too, of course, is uh, art for the artist versus art for the experiencer. So, just, you know, what is art? It's not just the experience, but it's the emotional part that the artist put into his work. Well, and it's how it fits within different cultural images and how those cultural images fit with your internal conditioning and expectations. It's complicated. Well, I think it's not all that complicated. Art, I think, is really is an expression. However, uh, and and it could be all kinds of things. I mean, it could be in writing, and uh, it could be poetry, or it could be in, in you know, painting, 
uh, or building or whatever. But it is expression. And, uh, and uh, where the difference comes in is some people will, will say, this is beautiful. I mean, it, it, it's in that way. And, and many others, I mean, will even go unnoticed or, you know, or something like that. Uh, so, so I think art is, uh, uh, it's the confusion part comes in where people say, well, this is real art. And they're talking about an expression that happens to hit everyone uh, very positively, like, like a beautiful painting, you know, could, could uh, uh, follow distribution and highlights and things of that sort. Now, one question, and I'll make this the last question here, and I'll just pose it as rhetorical, so I get the last word this way. And the question is, what about things like uh, computer code? Can you imagine some computer code that is done so elegantly that somebody who is a skillful observer looks at it and says, oh, that's beautiful. That's art. My so now code, let's go to climate disaster. Yeah. Well, my cold used to be like that. I've just OK. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I'm honored to be in your presence. <laughs> so Richard, what's this that once again we're saying the climate disaster is already here? Well, it's almost it's already here for every place except Lakeside. But outside of Lakeside, Earth is already becoming unlivable. And the questions we're going to see next week with COP26 is will governments act to stop the disaster from getting worse? We can't stop the disaster we can maybe stop it from getting worse. And as they look at this, uh, they now say, uh, this is a quote from a client scientist, quote, we have built a civilization based on a world that doesn't exist anymore. And the world is already heated up by about 1.2 C on the average since the pre-industrial areas. And one thing that has happened in this is a lot of that heat has gone into the ocean. And uh, this article has a staggering statistic. And that is right now, uh, every second, every second the oceans of the planet are absorbing the heat equivalent of five Hiroshima atom bombs being dropped into the water every second. Okay, so that's how much heat is going into the water and it's kind of a problem. And so one of the things that they have done like many people in this environment is they've made different scenarios uh, from a worst case scenario, which is where we don't do anything in an intermediate scenario in which emissions start declining around 2040. And then a best case scenario, which is some kind of fantasy land. And uh, if you look at global temperatures in even the intermediate case, they say by the time we get to uh, the next century, we're going to have 2.7 degrees C increase in temperature. So it's going to more than double the temperature rise that we've had already. And uh, of course, one of the things about this is we don't know how this terrifying experiment that we're doing on this planet is going to work out. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN says, 
quote, we are on a catastrophic path. We can either save our world or condemn humanity to a hellish future. And usually uh, you expect people who must be politicians to say things that are more positive. A hellish future doesn't sound very positive to me. But then I'm not a Baptist. Uh, yeah, I haven't been to hell either. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, they broke it down into several elements. And uh, the first of them is heat waves. And we know last year with these enormous fires from Canada to California and in Greece and all over the world uh, of the problems with fires. And, you know, we had this heat dome that was over uh, the West that uh, killed hundreds of people as well as they said there were a billion sea creatures that were roasted alive in their shells off the coast, a billion. And uh, the heat waves, one of the things that happens under uh, these scenarios is as they see as the temperatures go up, the frequency of the heat waves go up and uh, it looks like uh, it's a very good possibility that we will see the heat waves double over the next 20 or 30 years. And that's significant since we know the damage we saw this year was pretty significant. And beyond uh, 1.5 C, then the heat in the tropical regions of the world will start pushing societies to their limits where it's difficult for people to cool down. Uh, and then extreme heat waves could make parts of the Middle East too hot for humans to endure and their risk in China and in India so the heat is going to be a problem. And uh, the next part of the problem is the floods, because this increase in the hotter climate causes the atmosphere to hold more water. And then when it releases the water in rains, it releases more water. Surprising how that works. And the uh as the they look at the impacts of these climate issues uh some of the most dire impacts resolve around water both from the lack of it and by the inundation of it an example of the problems with storms for example Last year in Sudan, uh, they got the equivalent of a month's worth of rain in two days, and flooding there wiped out more than 100,000 homes. So these kind of damages can be significant. And again, as the temperature rises, goes up, the frequency of these kind of damages is going to increase. On the shortage side, uh, it looks like uh, within the next 30 years, half of the people on the planet are expected to have an inadequate supply of fresh water. So 5 billion people won't have enough fresh water to drink. So uh, that might be a problem. Then we have wildfires. Uh, until the last couple of years, I had not seen that on any of the lists of climate problems. But we saw uh, last year with uh, stuff in North America and in Europe with fires, then they say at three degree of heating, which is about what they say 
the intermediate path will give us by 2100, all of North America and Europe will be at heightened risk of wildflowers, fires, and this devastating cycle that we've seen in California of heat, drought, and fire will show up in many other places in the world. So uh, then if we're through with those things, we have crop failures. Crops already uh, are being affected by the climate change where the yields are going down now. And the kind of extreme crop failures that occur are drought related. And those drought related events are going to double in the next few years. So uh, we're gonna have a problem with the crops that people need. And despite the rapid uh, advance of renewable energy and electric vehicles, countries around the world are still mainly tied to fossil fuels. I'm sure Andrew would confirm that. And, you know, this is the problem with the climate and us knowing about it is really uh, an old issue. Lyndon Johnson, remember him? Remember LBJ? Uh, he was warned of the climate crisis. So you can't say that this is sudden and just snuck up on this. That was 50 years ago. Okay. And right now, again, the world is set the way we're going at 2.7 degree increase in temperature this century, even if all the emission reduction pledges that are currently made are all kept. And of course, we're behind on all of them. And at uh, this 2.7 C, it would be very bad much of the planet would become uninhabitable. And every decision that is being made now, every oil drilling lease, every acre of Amazon forest, uh, and how much more we continue to do it, each of these decisions determines how far we fall down the hill. And so uh, it's never too late to stop falling down the hill, but uh, we need to do something to reverse this. And we're going to see what the leaders of the world do next week. And I'm not confident in their ability to act on the scale that is required, especially since China's leader is not going to be there. Uh, and they are uh, presently the biggest problem in the world. Any thoughts? Well, I... the, prob the problem in the United States is that the politicians, they are trying to put a break on Biden's initiative to try to fix this problem. So we have a big problem in the States. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah, right after the, uh, the meeting in Scotland, uh, Guardian, I think it's the most important newspaper in, in England, at least, had a big article. And uh, many of the things that you mentioned uh, were also mentioned in this article. And so I thought nobody's ever come to read all of this stuff. This is one of the problems uh, why I believe people do not understand what is actually happening is because the information is there and it's uh, out there, but it is, it's just too much. Most people don't get farther than the first couple of paragraphs. So I thought I, I make a little uh, little synopsis of the things. If you like, I can read it out to you. It will take about two minutes. Sure. Uh, sure. So, okay. I, so this is from the from uh, this month on the twenty second of uh, of, the, of this year. It says the, the government who will convene in Glasgow will be challenged for we have run out the clock. This was a, somebody said, his name is Rogeli, or Rogel or something. He is a climate scientist at the 
Imperial College in London. He says, but we can still act. Said Heo, another climate scientist, with temperatures moving just a few tenths of a degree, we have dialed ourselves back about 125 million years. But now we're hitting a curve that we've never seen before. No one is sure how this will end. But after a 1.49 Celsius rise, uh, humanity will experience a painful and worsening slide towards a hellish future. We talked about that. Current levels of warming already have produced disastrous floods in Germany and in China. It is like fires from Canada to California, but also in Greece. Okay, thank you, John. Let's move on, please. Well, okay. Uh, anyway, this was another by uh, Amanda Maycock. Uh, of yes. the, okay. So but anyway, it's, it's most likely that we will hit 1.5 degrees C next decade, and corals, wetlands, alpine areas, and the Arctic mm -hmm. will disappear. Period. And so, and, and 4.9 of virtually 5 million people will die each year from extreme heat. And the American South, you may, didn't mention that, but Central America, Cuba, and coastal regions of Mexico will become unlivable. About 216 million people, mostly from developing countries, will be forced to flee, and about $23 trillion will be wiped from the global economy. That's also something I think that should be emphasized. Sure. Uh, so then this, this, this uh, scientist, Ao said, we've never seen the climate change this fast. We don't understand the nonlinear uh, linear effects but more CO2 means certainly more unpleasant developments, including famine. Okay, uh, anyway, again, thank you, John. Uh, we need to move on. Okay. Uh, um, just before we move on, one of the things that this article didn't mention, and the biggest uh, threat with all of this, is going to be the population migration pressure from the uh, affected areas. Right, absolutely. And... Uh, we're going to be in that lifeboat situation where we have to decide who gets in the lifeboat and who is kept out of the lifeboat. And there's going to be a lot of difficult political uh, decisions that need to be made. And it's going to be very, very tough for uh, liberals to, uh, to uh, exclude the people who aren't allowed in the lifeboat, that mm -hmm. there isn't room for in the lifeboat. So, and there will be many... Merkel's around to want people in. Yes. Yeah. I think Which all we need. Oh, go go ahead. ahead. Oh, I think what we need is for the writers and scientists and philosophers to come out with kind of works of fiction that would show the general population what things are actually going to be like and influence opinion so that it's not just the enlightened people who are prepared to do something about it. I think of something like Charles Dickens drew attention to the horrible conditions in, caused by the Industrial Revolution and then things got done by it. But it wasn't just him. It, but, um, you know, we're all convinced, but how do you convince the ordinary people who are only kind of trying to get ahead? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Richard, uh, if we want to move on to materials, what's this about light emitting diodes uh, that are low cost uh, and seem to be very, very efficient? Uh, this was what I had been thought of when I showed that picture of the periscovites. And these are something that are based on these crystals. And if you read through the details, there's more of interest than just they can make snazzy, efficient uh, LEDs in some new ways. How they're making them actually is... Uh, very interesting from a process viewpoint 
because they're basically making them with fluids that they put different elements in and with the fluids they make films and because the way they uh, constructed the fluids with the materials, the films end up making orderly periscovite crystals that can then, again, depending on how they're doped, the other impurities that are in these mixtures, these uh, stacks of films can make uh, very efficient LEDs of many colors and you know this stuff shows up in any of the display technologies and the lighting technologies and it's just a new and more efficient way to be able to make uh, these kind of semiconductor devices that are called LEDs because they generate light and as I say, from a process viewpoint, it's really interesting because they make it with making films and uh, this uh, making films is something that is very reproducible and very inexpensive. So it's just a new direction we have in terms of being able to make the materials from which we make our technologies. Any thoughts? If not, let's move on to space. And I, what's the difference between extraterrestrial intelligence being more artificial than biological? What's that about? Well, we uh, have been wondering about life on other planets for a long time, uh, certainly centuries, maybe millennia. But it's only recently that we've had an actual chance to find out. And that's what SETI was all about. And uh, one of the things that we should think about perhaps is what should we expect if one of these searches succeed? And just follow through this train of thought. Suppose there are these other planets where life can begin and follow the same kind of process that we follow with the Darwinian evolution. Uh, we know where that leads. And now if you look around uh, even our local galaxy, there are a lot of stars of the same class as the sun that are older than the sun. So imagine a star older than the sun with these conditions for life that maybe had a billion years head start. A billion years is a lot of time for stuff to happen. Now, if you look back at human civilization, what we would call civilization really only dates back a few thousand years. And it may be gone in another one or two centuries, some people think, because before humans made up of organic materials such as carbon are overtaken or transcended by inorganic intelligence such as AI. And uh, already we're seeing AI being used to evolve better AI, creating better and better versions of itself. So just imagine that goes on. And uh, then it turns out there, then the kind of human level intelligence that we have right now and are using right now might just be a brief interlude in our human history before the machines take over. And so if we're able to detect extraterrestrial life, is it going to be other organic beings like us? Or is it going to be some electronic version of life, the AI on the star next door? Uh, because of the time scales involved, it may be more likely that whatever we find 
is not organic, but uh, some kind of artificial life. And, you know, part of right now, the setting that we're using uh, focuses on the part of the electronic spectrum that is radio. You know, so these are uh, waves in one particular frequency range. Uh, and we haven't looked in other wave lights like uh, optical or x-ray because we don't know what kind of uh, frequencies these extraterrestrials will use to communicate. So we're not looking broadly enough to know. It also could be worthwhile to even look in traces in our own solar system. One of the scenarios that I've read about in science fiction that now the scientists are talking about is imagine an extraterrestrial civilization that had mastered nanotechnology. And then the way they would explore space is send their nanobot out to space. And if he found a good place, the master nanobot would create a bunch of slave nanobots and they could just take over. We haven't thought about looking for them yet. And, you know, if we did in our city receive a detectable, decodable radio message, how could we know the intention of the sender? There are a lot of other possible motivations besides, hi, I'm next door and I want to get to know you. And we don't know what these extraterrestrials will be thinking or how they'll be thinking or any of those things. In fact, these people argue, how do we know that we are not living in some kind of simulation created by a technologically superior alien? So maybe we are just living in the creation of some extraterrestrial AI. What is real anyway? I'm having trouble with all of this. Please help. Well, any thoughts? Yeah, well, um, human advancement is driven by motivation. And I don't understand how AI could become motivated the way that people have been. You know, uh, we're just building in to AI, as far as I can see, um, uh, the way to the, the way to stand still, you know, like <laughs> AI sh AI needs to be able to answer the questions that we're asking ourselves. <laughs> That's right. What's the meaning of life? <laughs> well, they already have AI that uh, teaches itself and can almost start right. with nothing and uh, yes, uh, develop. But uh, one of the things that's interesting is the uh, universe they calculate is only 13 billion years old and is, it, is expanding at quite a rate. So um, the universe they calculate is 50 billion years, light years across. So there's already universes out there that uh, cannot, we can never detect them because right. uh, information travels at the speed of light. So it's conceivable that uh, our planet was seeded by these intelligent uh, life forms a billion years ago, but they've already moved or we've expanded to the point where they can no longer communicate with us. So that's why we're left on our own to overheat the planet and uh, that's right. the best of things. Well, we didn't have very nice parents then. <laughs> yeah, we should blame the parents. <laughs> So, Richard, tell us about synthetic biology. What's that? Well, uh, synthetic biology is making natural things that have not existed before. And it's one of the areas that is great progress that's going on presently. And to give you some examples, just little details of 
uh, what can be done. Let's take pigs, okay? Pigs need phosphorus in their diet, but the phosphorus that comes from grain, which is mainly what we use for animal food, is in a form that pigs cannot digest. So they have to supplement the phosphorus and then the farmers can add an expensive enzyme to help the pigs break down the phosphorus and use it. But this is problemsome and expensive. And now uh, a synthetic biology company named EnviroPig, you can guess what they're focused on. Uh, their researchers inserted two genes into a pig genome, one from a strain of uh, E. coli and one from a mouse. And together, those two genes put in the pig genome enables the pig to produce the enzyme that it needs in its saliva. So instead of having a problem with phosphorus, then the pigs can metabolize the phosphorus in their food, and then they excrete uh, about one third of the phosphorus that normal, normal pigs do. And all this phosphorus in the pig excrement is what makes it difficult to handle and causes environmental problems. And I bet it smells. Anyway, so this is an environmental um, genetic change that you could make to pigs that make pigs much more environmentally friendly. And the synthetic biologists say now, we've made a mess of the planet, like we heard in the previous article. But they say now, thanks to biotechnology, we have tools to repair these organisms. And they're saying we should use them and that we should engineer species genomes to help them adapt to the climate in front of us, to drier soils, to more acidic ocean, to mire, more polluted water. And so synthetic biology could help solve some of our biggest problems with hunger and climate change and help us take care of the planet. And maybe they say it's time to embrace our role of taking care of the planet. And these technologies can solve pressing human problems. One example of this is golden rice. Golden rice has uh, vitamin, which vitamin? Vitamin A. And uh, vitamin A deficiency caused blindness in hundreds of thousands of children around the world. And golden rice has been genetically engineered to uh, produce vitamin A and take care of that uh, deficiency that causes the problem. They've had golden rice and its precursors now for more than 50 years. And just last year, it was finally introduced in the Philippines. Part of the problem with these products of genetic change in animals is there are all this web of regulations about food and animals that you have to deal with and get approval of before you can put them into use. So on one hand, we have a desire for the greater use of these new tools that we have to be able to help the species of the planet adapt to all of these changes. And on the other hand, we have basically a fairly conservative regulatory establishment around the world that 
even if we had these things, is limiting our ability to use it. And the people who understand these issues say that there is no doubt that synthetic biology helps us to solve some of the biggest global problems. We just have to let ourselves now use these new tools that we're developing. Any thoughts? Well, Richard, let's move on then to us and how, what's this about uh, an enriched environment for our brain that fires up our synapses? Well, they've known for a while that uh, <coughs> enjoying a beautiful environment, one that inspires us, studies have shown that such an enriched environment has a positive effect on child development and also on the human ability to regenerate, to learn and build new brain connections. Uh, and they have demonstrated this even after a stroke, that having an enriched environment speeds the recovery of the stroke patient uh, back to whatever degree of normal they're going to be able to get to. So they've known that for a while. What they haven't understood is how that works at a molecular level. And now they pushed the understanding through to that. And what they have found is that it all happens in the synapse. And that is uh, what connects the two cells and moves the signals from cell to cell. And what they found specifically is they did a study of proteins and lipids, oils that are at the synapse. And they studied those uh, among uh, experimental subjects that had had an enriched environment and an uncomfortable environment. And they discovered uh, almost 200 proteins and 20 lipids that were significantly different in how they were regulated and released at the synapse, depending upon the richness of the environment. So what they found is that uh, those uh, with the enriched environments, uh, their synapses worked better, signal processing is enhanced, that leads to faster learning and development. And uh, these chemicals, the lipids and proteins they found had a decisive effect on the functioning of the synapse and provides a molecular uh, explanation for it. Now, one of the things I found that was interesting within there is when they were looking at the proteins that had specific effect on the synapses and positive effect, the proteins they found involved were the proteins that are in, with the humans, organisms, endocannabinoid metabolism the endocannabinoid metabolism is your body's making of marijuana-like chemicals. And it turns out the marijuana-like chemicals at the brain synapse speeds them up and makes them work better. I don't know if uh, the consumption of the product does the same thing, but... Anyway, it's interesting, and we are continuing to learn more about it, and particularly learning that this enriched environment promotes a kind of healing, uh, maybe gives us avenues that we can have the chance to use later in our life with people we care about. Any thoughts? 
I think uh, Chapala uh, and the expat community is a good example for stimulating environment from um, the language, the climate, the art, and in so many other ways. You're right. We should have you on our Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll be there. Ben Richard, for our last story, what's this about pig kidney transplants? Well, it's a good story, except for uh, the Jews and the Muslims. And so surgeons have attached a pig kidney to a human and watched it work. Uh, they attached this pig uh, kidney to a pair of large blood vessels outside the body of a deceased recipient and observed it for two days. And in that time, it found there was a normal function and there was no rejection. So as far as they could tell, it looked like a normal kidney. Now, they've been looking at pigs as uh, for organ transplants for a while now. And, but the problem with pigs is there's a sugar in their cell which the human body treats as foreign and it causes an immediate uh, rejection of the organ. And the kidney in this experiment came from a gene edited animal that was engineered to eliminate that sugar and thus avoid that immune system uh, attack. And this development, they think, should reassure patients and researchers and regulators that they're moving in the right direction. The dream of animal to human transplants goes back really to the 17th century with initial uh, attempts that didn't work out very well to use animal blood for transfusions. Uh, in the 20th century, and surgeons were transplanting uh, organs from baboons into humans. They're pretty close fit. And the most famous one was in baby Faye, a dying infant who received a baboon heart and lived for 21 days. But there was a lot of uproar about that and it didn't succeed and scientists turned from primates to pigs tinkering their genes to make them work better. Pig valves have been used successfully for decades. Pig skin grafts are used all the time for burns. Pig corneas are used to replace sight uh, eyes and Bio, there are several biotech companies now that are uh, working to develop suitable pig organs for transplants to help ease the human organ shortage. And for example, in the US, there's more than 90,000 people waiting for a pig transplant. So every day, 12 people die while waiting for it. So there's an enormous uh, built up demand for these uh, kidneys for, that from pigs. And in December, the US FDA approved the gene alteration in these pigs as safe for human food consumption and for medicine, but it is still uh, after more paperwork before pig organs could be transplanted into living humans. So I would say it looks like this is coming. They're doing the kind of work they need to get it approved. I don't know how much more work they have to do, but I know that uh, this could be uh, literally a life-saving thing for many, many people. Any thoughts? Oh. One thought was, uh, I don't think you're quite right, uh, Richard, saying that the Jewish people or the Muslims would reject 
this idea. Uh, they only avoid eating uh, right. pig. <laughs> they are quite happy to use, uh, um, you know, medical products and all sorts of stuff that come from pig. So I, they're going to be okay with this. Well, I think you're probably right. I was just taking, making a cheap joke. The patients, the patient in the test was not dead, was brain dead. Ah, uh, okay. So that's why the system was still working. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, if it had brought his brain back, they would say that's certainly cool. <laughs> And it's interesting too, the surgeon involved had a heart transplant himself three years ago. Okay, so, so he really believed in the process. Yeah. He's interesting. Got literally skin in the game, I guess. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I have been amazed at advertisements uh, for medicines, uh, which on US television channels come with high frequencies. And they mention that if you had this or that transplant, their medicine may not be appropriate. Because I didn't realize that in the United States, transplants <laughs> had some commonality. Mm -hmm. So certainly it must be common enough for them to mention it in their drug commercials. Interesting. Well, thanks a lot, Richard. Good session, and uh, thanks to everybody for participating, and we'll see you next week. Bye yes, for now. Thank you. Okay. See you next week. Good Thank you. Good to well, be with you. Adios. Well,